Welcome to part two. I have a link in the comments section for part one where we did uh, 13 through 25 in the brand pyramid. And we're going to kick off today starting with number 12. And probably tick off a few of you as we go up to the top. We may even start with number 12. Stay tuned. At number 12, I have Ducati. And Ducati, and this will probably be the most controversial pick of, of any of them to many of you folks out there. And, and because the media really has been on the Ducati bandwagon for a long time, the real popular MotoGP is, I just don't get it. I, they're very expensive bikes. They look very pretty. Uh, but I just don't see them as a as a very good street bikes they've had looking at stability wise the Cotty started in 1926 and that was fi founded by a dad and his three sons which is great but since 1926 they've had as many owners as Zsa Zsa Gabor had husbands which is nine and then that doesn't shout stability to me now there are some bikes that I do like but most of the bikes I like of Ducati are the old ones this 1965 uh, 250 Mach 1 I thought was beautiful. I actually got to ride one of these when I was a youngster. I didn't get to ride one of these, the Mike Halewood edition, which I saw at the uh, at the Meekum auction, which I thought was beautiful. And I came close to, in 2009, of getting one of these GT 1000 Classics. Although I did really like this the silver the silver Ducati here a little bit better, but thought the GT would actually be more functional. I guess if I had to have a Ducati today and I had to pick one, I'd pick one of these Scramblers, which I think is a beautiful bike. Don't get me wrong, Ducati's a fantastic brand, but I just think they're overrated. That'll be controversial. I have KTM number eleven and. And I really would like to see them up higher because I do kind of like their philosophy that their bikes are race ready. I'm not too crazy about everything painted orange, but they do have a few little blue items here and there now. But when I checked their reliability, when I checked the reliability, one of the checks I did was I checked the database and the recalls. They don't have a lot of recalls, which is the blue line here, but what they do have is a lot of complaints that, that which is an orange line which means they're not being proactive in dealing with their customer complaints and they're also letting their customers find some of the issues that they probably should be finding at the factory before they sell the bikes so until they get that remedy I'm gonna to have to keep KTM with number 11 even though I'm gonna show you some bikes that I really think are exciting bikes Cracking the top 10, I have Harley Davidson, but quite honestly, they probably should be somewhere around 17 or 18. Fair, I banged on KTM for having so many customer complaints, and but if you look at Harley Davidson, their customer base is very unhappy with them. Let me show you the customer complaints here. Uh, then recalls are in blue, and the customer complaints are in orange, but they have a tremendous amount of complaints. Uh, and a high number of recalls. Only one higher in recalls is BMW in the last five years. But I have to give them credit for the Pan American and the Sportster. The Revolution Max and the Pan American is not my cup of tea, but apparently it's a lot better than most people expect it. I think the Sportster is a little disappointment because of the riding position. The new, uh, new Icon series, which kind of looks like just a regular Harley with just a little older. It's nice looking, but they're so expensive. They built something that never was in the Brock Street Fighter. And the only Harley Davidson, and probably the reason I have them number 10, is what they could have built the Cafe Racer. That I kind of like the looks of. I know you think I'm plumb crazy. I got your all at number 9. Okay, I know most of you certainly wouldn't have your all this high. Are you this high? 
but I'm a kind of a sidecar guy too. Here's a picture of my sidecar that I had way back when. I think I had hair then that was dark. But I think they're pretty cool. Uh, I think they're overpriced and a little bit impractical. But mostly I think they're cool. Given the world events of recently, we might not see too many Urals around in the future, at least in the Western countries. When you go to the website, i got to give them credit. This is the first thing I came across. Stop the war now. So, eh, it's pretty brave considering where they're at and located. But they have some really nice stuff. Um, they have, uh, you can have a lot of fun on these things. You can, they look really cool. You can do a lot of things with it. You can stuff three or four grandkids in here. And the uh, other part of it is, they even, they're even doing an electric prototype. Can you imagine an electric prototype on a sidecar? Well, I'm sitting here looking at my computer screen and wondering um, how I'm going to present number eight, Norton. Norton has a, such a wide and long story. It's been through so many things since it started in 1902 in Birmingham, England. And it's went through financial problems. It's went up, up and down. It's went. It's been resurrected and killed and crushed, and and it's had such such great motorcycles throughout the period of time. And uh, it's just now recovering from what we have to consider probably the worst owner in the in the group is John. Uh, I mean Stuart Garner. <laughs> And the people he dragged down with him, like the John McGinnis, the one of the best racers, the TT racers of all time, and he drugged poor John through this mud with him. But there's been so many great mo Norton motorcycles. It it they have to be number eight, and they're on their way back now. Um, since well, they've had even had the government involved with Norton, at, you know propping them up and things like that so i can't i'm not going to go through the litany of owners and the suffering they have they've had i'm going to present some of the bikes that that you know they've had rotary bikes they've had police bikes they've had single cylinder bikes they've had tt winning bikes so i'm going to show you just a few of these and um and well hopefully today i'm gonna you know we i have to give credit to and Kenny D Dreer, uh, he's an American that uh, really helped develop the 961 Commando uh, into something pretty special in 1990. And he was forced to stop through financial problems in 2006. That's when old, our buddy old Stuart Gardner got involved and drug Norton and his reputation down through the mud, stranding dealers. Um, breaking dealers in the United States who had to end up paying those costs that they didn't do, taking deposits on bikes that they were never going to make. And those fi financial shenanigans really, this man, if he's not in jail, he should have been, and, and so should some of his, his friends. But fortunately for Norton and us, uh, they've come back through the uh, Indian company, TVS, I had bought the company in 2020 and looks like they're on the right road back and there's really it's still one Norton I'd, I'd like to have and this is the one at number seven I have Yamaha as hard as it was for to talk about Norton and all the tragedy they had in their story it's hard to talk about Yamaha without talking about all the successes they've had especially in racing Yamaha first first motorcycle was the YA-1. It's a 125 two-stroke back in 1955. 1957, they were the first Japanese company with a five-speed transmission in the YDS-1, a 250 two-stroke. By the 1960s, they were racing internationally. They've won just about everything they've raced at, including the Paris Dakar with a 1979 with the XT500. They're particularly good at road racing. Cal Crothers road raced the RZ250. 
I'll mispronounce his name. It's Yar Yarno Sarin, uh, won the Daytona in two hundred and nineteen seventy three on a TZ three fifty. Hard to count how many Grand Prix wins Yamaha has had over the years. Two hundred forty two Grand Prix wins. They have at least twenty nine motocross world championships. Stefan Everts winning 101 wins, the most ever in motocross. They've won the AMA Motocross Championship nine times. Yamaha won the Daytona 200 13 consecutive times. Yamaha's first four-stroke was a 1968 XS 650. Here's a picture of the 1975 TZ. I think it was a 700, well, I'm sure it was a 750 that they outlawed in 1975. In 1970, Yamaha introduced reed valve induction in the RD line. They were famous for also for the dual purpose bikes of the DTs in the 1970s. They introduced the monoshock in 1973 on the YZ250. The D350, like the one I'm showing you here, was sold in some countries until 1990. I owned one of those in 1985. Heck, even uh, Kira Von Tassi won the, uh, the motocross championship, the women's motocross championship on a Yamaha several times. Yamahas continue to win MotoGPs with a lot of those victories coming from Valentino Rossi and up until today. Out of the YZF R1 is right here. Looks sharp. In 2022 they're also updating the Tenere 700. The list wouldn't be complete without the 2022 MT-10. My One of my favorite YouTubers out there rides the MT-10 Banditman UK. Although I think his looks a little bit better than this. What do you think, Banditman? At number six, a surprise to many of you is Royal Enfield. How did Royal Enfield get to be number six? It got to be number six for me because I like the way they look. They don't cost a lot of money. And the company has done a tremendous amount of qualities and quality improvement in the last well they started building them in Royal Enfield started building in 1901. It was built in England in Redditch, England. Royal Enfield Bullet is one of the longest lived motorcycle models in the world. Started out in uh, 1932 this model, and they built it in a 250, 350, and a 500. The Royal Enfield has the longest unchanged production run of any motorcycle and remained in production since 1948. The Bullet is even older, has passed 75 years of continuous production. 1955 Royal Enfield partnered with uh, Madaris Motors in uh, India for 800 um, Royal Enfield bullets, 350 bullets to be built. 1962, all of those components for those 800 motorcycles were all built in India. 1955 to 1959, Royal Enfields sold in the U.S. were uh, sold under the brand of Indians. Each factory closed in 1967. Spares parts operations were sold to Velocet and they stayed in operation till around 1970-1971. In 1990 the Maduras group collaborated with the Eichner group and they merged. In 1999 the Royal Enfields and Indians began badging themselves as the Royal Motorcycles as Royal Enfields. New factories were being built and by in 2017, it had actually had started production of their third plant. Teen Royal Enfield brought the Harris Performance uh, Product Group in England, and together with Harris, they designed some new models. The team was a big year for Royal Enfield. They established a North American headquarters in Milwaukee. 2016, Royal Enfield brought out the Himalayan, and it's been very popular. Here's the 2016 model. And here's a 22 and 22 model. 2017, they introduced the Royal Enfield 650 Interceptor. 
and a Royal Enfield Continental 650. 2017, I also bought my first Royal Enfield as a Classic Chrome. Production of the Classic Chrome 500 ended in 2020. The Meteor series was introduced, the 350 Meteor was introduced, I think, in 2020. And you can't forget about, uh, they've made some, Royal Enfields make some great models. They made one from 1939 to 1945. It was designed for World War II to be dropped out of airplanes. And it was the 125cc two-stroke. It's called a flying flea. Royal Enfield also had some production twins from 1949 to 1963. They had one, this 500cc, called the Meteor Miner. Uh, they had a 700cc called the Super Meteor. And they had another 700cc, one called Constellation. And in 1964, they had the Continental GT Cafe Racer, which looked very much like the uh, Continental 500 they built in 2013. And I think the last model that came out of the Royal Enfield in England was the uh, 736 Interceptor. There's a lot up to be excited about with Royal Enfield. They've done really well. Uh, they're just now taking off and starting to sell a lot of motorcycles. I think in 2015 they out uh, sold Harley Davidson worldwide. So they're going up pretty good. And they're coming up pretty fast. The products are affordable they have nice quality and they look great at number five moto guzzi i don't own one i've never owned one mr bill's got one rapid roy's got one and i do get to ride them the only thing that's ever kept me from owning one is the nearest dealer seems to always be 300 miles away but still yet number five moto guzzi it was actually started by uh, it was envisioned by three friends that were stationed together in World War I. I butcher the names, but Giorgio Paradis, Giovanni Ravelli, and Carlo Guzzi. Now, these three guys thought of this. Unfortunately, Reve Ravelli died in an aircraft ca crash in 1918. So, they, so he had basically the two pilots and you had Guzzi was the uh, I guess he was a mechanic. Some of the earliest bikes uh, bore the name of Guzzi Parody mainly do shield the shipping fortunes of Parody. Uh, soon they changed the name just to Moto Guzzi though Carl's Guzzi received royalties on each bike. Carl initially didn't have any ownership in the company at all. Carlo did some uh, engine designs actually from 1921 up until the mid 40s and 50s. The Moto Guzzi just made single cylinder, horizontal cylinder engines. Um, they had different sizes, and they competed in Moto uh, GP. I'm sorry, they competed in GP racing until 1957 season, and after that they they were finished with that. But their bikes won 3,329 races. Pretty good job, Moto Guzzi. Struggled just like everybody else after World War II. But 1964, the company was in financial crisis. Uh, Parody was dead, and Carlos Guzzi had retired. So the direction of the company fell to Enrico Parody, one of uh, and Giorgio's brother. So that's who, who picked up the reins. Later in, in uh, 1964, uh, Carlo Guzzi died. In 1967, Moto Guzzi was in state control, and that's where they developed, or really the, started developing the 90-degree V-twins. The first one, I think, was 700 cc's and about 45 horsepower. Later on, they would have 750s, 850s, 1100s, and 1200s. In 1973 through 2000, Di Tommaso, of the car fame, actually ran and owned Moto Guzzi. 1975, they came out with one of the most iconic Moto Guzzi's, the 850cc Le Mans Mark I, and it continued to be uh, revised up into a Mark V in, in the 1990s. 
1980s, Goosey's Grade F4 valve head of the 650s and 7, 750s. In 2004, uh, 2000 to 2004, those were their pretty years. Um, I didn't really understand that. Prilia on road a Goosey, and I think the best they, thing they did was kind of renovate the Monadello uh, Moto Goosey factory. From 2004 until now, it's uh, Moto Goosey's owned by Piaggio. They used to be a, a competitor to them in scooters back in the day. I'm going to show you some uh, some of the pictures of Moto Goosey's that I haven't shown you so far. Uh, from the first, very first model, 1921. Then we have the, uh, which is really nice, a single cylinder. Then we have the 2000 V8 V7 Classic. And coming up until today, until the 2020 V7 Cafe Racer. And the V100 uh the green one, which I think is a special edition, the Centennial, and the V100, which is the red one, which is one of the new models. You notice the exhaust is coming out the sides. And last but not certainly least, one of my favorites, the V85 TT. Even though I don't own a Moto Goosey, I'd love to own one. I, I, like, I like to get it to ride them every chance I get. Uh, I think they're lovely bikes. Uh, they're not a bike that you get in a hurry on, but it's they still have a, a very good legacy, a good character to the bike. A little expensive, but not too bad. Moto Guzzi number five. At number four, MV Augusta. What a wonderful Italian manufacturer with a great history in, in, in racing. It was started in 1945 in Italy. The Count Augusta as part of an aircraft uh, company that was founded in 1923. However, after World War II, they were forbidden to produce aircraft, so they had to do something to stay in business. So they actually started out making this 98cc single cylinder two stroke. Uh, they started actually thinking about it in 43, but started building it in 1945. It was called, the first one was actually called the Vespa 98, but I think Piaggio already had that name, so they changed it to a Turismo and an Economica. The truth be told, I, you know, they're number four on my list because uh, back in 1971, they had this outrageous Augusta 750S red, white, and blue that, you know, at that time I just thought that was the greatest looking machine around. And... I think probably the, uh, the the new machines that I really the next machine I really liked I saw out in the road race uh, course one time is 1999 F4 those four lovely exhaust pipes coming out and today if I had if I could buy one I could afford to buy one I would buy this blue Alpine uh, Super Veloci it's one of the prettiest motorcycles I think I've seen now. The second thing about MV Augusta you have to know is Giacomo Agostini, or Ajo. He won a tremendous amount of road races. Agostini st didn't start racing until he was 21 years old in 1963. And I was aboard a Italian 170, 175 Marini, and he won the championship. Then in 1964, he won the 350 championship. But he moved to where he got all his fame, really, was when he was riding for MV Augusta from uh, starting in 1965. And when he's a teammate for Mike Halewood. And barely, almost, if his motorcycle had quit, had won, would have won the 350cc championship, but finished second there. But he went on to win seven straight 500cc championships. And seven times he also won the 350cc championship and in addition to that he had 10 Isle of Man championships he left uh, MV Augusta for a season in 1974 to ride with Yamaha but occasionally he still rode with 
with uh, MV until 1976. And he wrote the three in the, uh, the four cylinder. First, listen to the four cylinder. Listen to the three cylinder. Like I said, MV Augustus number four is mainly because of they got beautiful motorcycles and Giacomo Agostini, one of the world's best road racers ever. All right. Starting number three, we got a Honda. And I'm going to move it a little faster and finish this up pretty quick now because everybody's familiar with the last three brands and I'm really not going to have to go into the history. I was going to show you some of the bikes that I like on each one of these brands. Basically, the bikes I like are why they're where they're at. I like Honda. I've grown up with Honda and from the very beginning of all these bikes, these 10 bikes I'm going to mention mean something to me. The first one is a 1966 CB160. It's the first real, one of the first real motorcycles I rode. Then the next one would be a 1968 CB350, which was my brother. Uh, let me ride his. I really enjoyed that. The next bike, I think everybody at my age at a particular time, was a 1969 CB750. I uh, really like that bike. Never did own one. I think Mr. Bill had one of those. I don't know if it's 69 or not. And my, one of my friends had a 1972 CB500, which was really a super not motorcycle. It sounded great. It looked great. It didn't run quite well, but that, you know, it ran all right for a Honda. And one that I owned here was a 1976 uh, 550 F1. Uh, I owned that uh, about two or three years ago, actually. My next bike I never did own, but I did ride, and I really liked it. It was pretty heavy for me. It's a 1979 CBX 1000. Now, I'm not just stuck in yesterday. I do like some of the Hondas today. Uh, for instance, the 2021 Honda Fireblade I really like. Actually thinking about getting a CT125. And I've always admired this one, and I don't think we can get it here. It's a CB1300. So those are the Hondas I like, and that's why I have Honda number three. Okay, I get number two. I've got BMW. I'm trying to separate the, the motorcycles from some of the other BS that goes on with BMW. I really do not like the marketing elitism. I was a, actually a sales manager for uh, BMW motorcycles for a while, and I did not like it then, and I still don't like it today. And I do have some concerns about the reliability. Uh, I'll pop up a slide here. They had the most recalls for the last, from 2016 to 2021, of any motorcycle brand. But besides that, uh, I'd have the number two because I do like the motorcycles. And I'm gonna start with the very first one. I saw it made a big impression on me as a kid it was in night as 1961 r60 2 i just liked the the mechanical bits and bobs about it even as a kid and as i was growing up and i was in an army and stationed in germany um one of the bikes i really liked was the r90s it's 1976 and um really liked it if i had any money i would have probably bought one but unfortunately, at the time, I did not have any money. The third motorcycle is the R80 GS. It's 1980. I saw Werner Wachner riding an R80 around on an Edelweiss tour. And he just was just magical, his riding skills on that bike. We lost Werner a couple years ago, but he was really good. Number four was a is a dad bike. It's a R one hundred RT. You know we were talking did did things about do we have 
dorky dad bikes or not. Well, if this is a this is probably the closest one for BMW from on my list anyway. And number five was one of the um, the only GS I have on my list for BMW. It was R one hundred GS. Um, it was the black and yellow Bumblebee edition. I really did like that. Number six was the is an R fifty R R eight fifty R. This was actually the first motorcycle I sold as a uh, salesman for BMW, so that's why it's on my list. Uh, number seven on my list is a K eleven hundred RS. I really generally didn't like the K box, although I did own a K seventy five S. But I thought this black and silver K eleven hundred RS was a cool bike and it just so happened one of the riders we sold it to was one of the coolest riders around so that's why it makes my list number eight is the bike i currently own is a bmw r9 t slash five it's the lupine blue love this bike it's uh, it does everything really well and it's pretty quick on um, as far as touring bikes uh, bmw i'm not much of an rt or much of a big GS fan, but I do like the R1250 RS as far as what it does. Although they've hurt the styling a little bit lately, but I like the R50, R1250 RS. If it's, that's what I get before I get a GS or an RT. And one of the sportiest bikes in BMW is my last one. Number 10 is S1000RR. I think it's, they, they look, look good. They run good. I've run against them out the drag strip. They run really good, and I've been very impressed with that. So this is why I have BMW number two. So I wonder who's number one. All right, here's number one. It has to be Triumph. Come on, man. If you're watching my channel at all, you know it's going to be Triumph. To be, but You have to be impressed by Triumph. John Bloor bought the company back in 1983, and actually licensed Les Harris to build uh, the T140 from 1983 to 1988 while he got together the uh, wherewithal and all the machining and design for the first Triumphs that were in Europe in 1990. Triumph didn't come to the United States until 1995. Now John ran the company from the time he bought it in 1983 until 2011 when his son Nick took over. Nick had a few shaky years for most of us Triumph folks but I think he's on track right now. Let's take a look at some of those those Triumphs that uh, that made Triumph number one. I guess I'd first start with the 1937 Speed Twin. I think that's just lovely. It's just the engine. Edward Turner um, was, wasn't that great of a manager I don't think but this one you have to give him credit for and the very next triumph kind of iconic and still going today is the 1959 uh, Triumph Bonneville that was the first one that orange and white I really loved that and growing up I used to watch Triumph racing and well I actually didn't watch them because there wasn't anything on TV but I read about them in magazines guys like Gary Nixon, number nine. He was a tough racer. Gene Romero. I even got a Gene Romero jacket. And one of the most famous racers during that period of time, uh, bike-wise, was called Slippery Sam. It was a 1970 Trident. It won five consecutive 750cc TTs at the Isle of Man from 1971 to 1975. And it had the best average speed about 102 miles an hour and that's on 84 horsepower I've never read actually what it did run but the average 102 you had to figure that today the fastest bikes out there are averaging 132 and they have over 200 horsepower so slippery Sam and of course you know I do like my Triumph Thruxton R I have that my first Triumph I bought uh, was a 1996 Thunderbird, kind of like this one. One of the one of the many Triumphs I sold, but one of the 
One of the special triumphs I saw was this 1997 T595 with aluminum frame. I really did like that bike. Then in today's bike, the 2022 Speed Triple RS, it's just a, it's a lovely bike. And, you know, if you go to somebody better as an ambassador than Steve McQueen, the king of cool, then uh, we'll anoint you the number one brand. But these are my picks, folks. Uh, you may have something, you should have something totally different. These just my opinion. I wanted to also mention that I got a couple honorable mentions here that didn't get to make the cut was Laverda. I really like their, their, their bikes. Uh, especially the big three-cylinder bike that they had. And I also like Moto Marini. Uh, I like the little small uh, three-and-a-half they had. So this is mine. Sorry for taking so long, but it was supposed to be a 15-minute video there. and up about 35. This is Flat Cap Cafe Racer out. Join me and my friends at Flat Cap Cafe Racer for riding and racing. Please subscribe.